So good afternoon, members of parliament, high council dignitaries, honorable prime minister, SG's keynote speaker, Mr. Omar, support staff, the media, and the general public currently present. Welcome to the first informative session on slavery pass, atonement, and reparation. Our hope for this session is to inform, educate, and encourage dialogue by providing clarity on the duty and role of the Advisory Committee on Slavery, Atonement, and Reparation, and the steps moving forward from the apology. However, before we can move forward from the apology and truly engage in real discourse as to what reparatory justice means and is for the people of St. Martin, we must first have an understanding of what reparatory justice means in the words of the Honorable Prime Minister herself, how we address reparation is equally as important as what we need to address. The ways in which we approach reparation and decolonality cannot stem from the same paradigm. It is eminent that the tools and language used in the discourse surrounding an apology for the atrocities that were the enslavement of our ancestors and the subsequent reparations be in one that our general public understands. To frame black and indigenous people of color and Caribbean histories around the canality alone recklessly perpetrates the notion that our narratives and identities can only exist in the relation to the colonizer. We must be allowed the time and space needed to reconnect with our histories beyond canality as a precursor to setting the conditions for reparations. Note, it is from this premise that we wish to continue with today's dialogue. And with that said, and no further ado, please permit me to invite the Honorable Prime Minister and Minister of General Affairs, Ms. Silvera Jacobs, to provide you with Good afternoon. With protocol being established, I warned them that this would be a full room. And I'm still trying to see if we can fit any more chairs in here, but at least it gives a good sign that there is interest within our community, and we will definitely have to look for bigger accommodations for the next sessions. As Ayana mentioned, for me, it is very important that we as government not only speak from the top, but also ensure that the voices, this is not a topic that was discussed broadly uh, across our communities in the past, and so we must engage with our community as we move forward. A lot may say, oh, why did we wait until the Dutch decided to apologize? I can't say that we necessarily did. Maybe we as a government, yes, but there have been grassroots organizations, NGOs, and other cultural icons that have been doing a lot of the groundwork, and I wanna say thank you, thank you, thank you for the hard work you've been doing. And as St. Martin, we have acknowledged um, the importance of July 1st for the past 12 years and counting. And so we are not where we maybe want to be, but we are definitely moving along. Semper progradients, as you would say, in the true St. Martin way. I want to also, even though it wasn't acknowledged, acknowledge Inko Susana, who plays such a key role in all our ceremonies and invoking the ancestors, et cetera. And I, I, you know, sitting watching you, I was like, I should call you up to maybe do that. I don't know if you do it impromptu, but if you would grace us, I would appreciate it. Let's give us a moment of silence for that. And she's prepared. Always. Thank you so much. Um, most of our Emancipation Day celebrations, even though government has one, we join voices on Amelia Wilson Park for that celebration as well, where we always walk on our bare feet, on the earth, connect, ground ourselves, and allow the ancestors to envelop us. And I'm always blessed by the blessing that you bring to every organization, every event. So hopefully the water is ready. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you please stand? I would like to take a minute of silence for the ancestors who I have invited to be here with us today. Some of you may feel them. Some of you may not, but I must say that they are here, so I invited them. I will do some libation before I start. 
चले मंजाना होना चले मंजान चले मंजाना होना चले मंजान शंगो मंजाना होना शंगो मंजान शंगो मंजाना होना शंगो मंजान This is a great moment and opportunity for us as St. Martiners to unite to ask for guidance, for wisdom, for knowledge, for understanding. It's a bittersweet situation, but let us use the wisdom, the knowledge that is in our DNA. We don't have to look far. It is in us. Let us ask to remember to remember our ancestors and their greatness to remember who we are because we are never alone they are all around us they are with us but most they are in us so when we ask we will receive ask it from your higher self from your higher knowledge your higher wisdom your higher understanding let us not be greedy let us understand that we have to do this together everyone has to play a significant role if we want to move forward it's not going to happen 1 2 3 it's going to take years but allow the generation after us to enjoy what our ancestors have given us what we will give to them that it could pass on to seven generations after them because that is what it's all about thank you thank you very much of course sana you will be seated all we receive that blessing and may it resonate in our spirits and in our voices and strengthen us as we move forward So while as I said before we may not like the circumstances the manner in which etc we are here and we cannot allow the movement to take place without us we must be part of our own story and in creating what will be from years from now history and look back when they look back and say well, what did you do when you had an opportunity besides complain about it we can have would have be able to say we did something we started something and so it starts with dialogue and i must say based on the discussions and dialogue that has happened since then even within the region the rest of the region is actually quite happy with the steps being made and seeing st martin now at the forefront of something that they will all be able to benefit from and so i hope that we can stand still by that moment and appreciate it in speaking to some other stakeholders who have been in the trenches for a long long time we cannot only look at the negative sides of what this history has brought us we can also look at the good sides and the resilience we've proven though more many don't want to hear that word because of hurricane and pandemic anymore but it is what makes us who we are to so despite whatever struggles we are going through today understand that there is always a way forward from that learn the lesson grow stronger and move forward and so we are here today to start the discussion in earnest finalize the process for our committee to be established so that we st martin determine where we want to go from here on in a lot is being said and a lot has happened but in our day to day actions in our institutions we still have even in our thoughts the vestiges that have been left over from the period of enslavement and the post colonial the period of colonialism that was after that and what still exists today for me it is important that though we acknowledge that a step has been made by the dutch government in expressing an apology which from their point of view is an apology 
we have to determine for us how much of an apology that is, what is still required, and how we move forward. We cannot wait for them to tell us what it will be, how it will be. And something that you may not know is that in one of the discussions had before the 19th, when trying to get a clearer picture of what would be done and said on that day, um, and the question was asked about reparations, I was told clearly, um, we are already helping you. And then some may understand then why I said what I said on the 19th. Because I knew that there would be no discussion on reparations. There is a fund for education and awareness. It's also clear that it's not, at this point, designated to have any level of continuity. We were unclear. 200 million, that's it. It's not like something that's going to be budgeted yearly. That was made clear. So are we going to just sit back and, okay, some question, a museum in the Netherlands, what about here? What about the other countries? And then in a few weeks after that, museum people were on the island. Not necessarily, the Amsterdam group was not connected to the apology. So this is where education and awareness comes in and where things can be convoluted and pulled together. The 27 million that was mentioned was something decided years ago in 2017 for the Amsterdam Museum that these persons in Amsterdam have been fighting for for years. And so that money is for that. They pulled it into the apology. So we must be cognizant. We must be understanding. We are, yes, a country in debt. We are in debt as normal countries would take loans for investments, but also specifically, especially, much more so because of the recent disasters. And so I said it then, any assistance being given now cannot be talked about in the same breath with reparations. This is something I have said. I would like to hear what you will say. The apology for our government did not contain everything you would expect, and those expectations were based on the discussions and the little research we were able to do based on CARICOM 10 point reparations plan, based on discussions in, in the community, and hearing and talking and looking and reading. So it is with great pleasure that I was able to meet our guest speaker today, Mr. Dobreen and um, Omar, and for him and his committee of CARICOM to continue to pledge to assist St. Martin in finding its footing, in making sure that we have a clear path forward that is based on what we deem necessary to be done to properly atone for the atrocities that have been executed on our ancestors and that we do so unequivocally that we stand in the right of the descendants of those who were abused, murdered, raped, kidnapped, trafficked, things that they would put you in jail for for years today, things that they now hold us accountable for because we can't account for how these people got here, how those got there, etc. And the reality of the fact that the Dutch played such a key role, not just in the enslavement of peoples in the Dutch, what is considered the Dutch Caribbean, but in the entire Western Hemisphere. So the apology falls short. And I see a lot of shaking heads, so that is at least good to know that I didn't speak out of turn without consulting you. We all agree. <laughs> Thank you. So today, we're at a start. Some felt it was necessary to still replay the English version of the apology so that those who may not have heard it would be able to get it in context. So after my remarks, that will be done. 
And I will not go into my response. If anything, these introductory remarks would be able to give you the gist of where I stood on that, and I'm unapologetic about it. In standing for St. Martin sometimes, yes, I have to be diplomatic. Yes, I have to sometimes swallow back the things I would have said and spouted at age like 10 years, 12 years ago without thinking. But today I have to think about what the repercussions are, not just for me, but for the community. And so community has to play the role of being unbarred in what you can say and what you say. But trust me, with a strong community voice, a strong voice internationally, regionally, it cannot fall on their ears. As a matter of fact, nothing happens per chance. A lot of times it was questioned, why are you taking these expensive trips to New York for United Nations General Assembly? They don't even have the Martin flag there. But guess what? Based on those trips, the international pers um, countries, representatives who were there, the regional ones, I, didn't, I don't have money to travel to St. Kitts and Nevis and Jamaica, St. Lucia, um, Suriname, all of the others, Dominica and Jamaica, that I was able to meet in that week there. And Finland and all of the other countries that are big donor countries, just like the Netherlands. And who will now hold them accountable for what they heard in those sessions? That St. Martin is part of a kingdom but has no access to the funding. That St. Martin, because it's part of a kingdom, does not have access to international funding or regional funding. And we are trying to become a part of CARICOM, but it costs 200,000 plus a year, which we're already in a deficit budget, so we're waiting on the funds to be able to do that. So the reality of that that development is expected by 2030 and by 2050, sustainable development, but the funds is, are not there for it. The investors aren't clamoring coming here to just invest in those things. You're in a, a catch-22 as a part of the rich kingdom. So guess what happened in November when I went to the Netherlands? Suddenly funds are available. Funds are available through the Hrui funds for climate, so anything that's related to climate. We had a recent visit from the Minister or the State Secretary of Culture and Media. We can get assistance now for archiving and anything to do with our museums, to build the museums, NGOs, all kinds of O's have access to the funding now, not just government. Funding, not loans. So sometimes, though you sound like you're a lone voice in a big crowd, if enough persons with influence hear you, there are results. There are results. And so I believe moving forward, we might have to take one or two steps backward every now and again, but we will continue to plod forward. We will continue to fight the good fight and leave something for the other generations behind us to continue to work with and that's why when I look around the room, I see all generations, and I applaud you for your interest in this. Something that I just want to touch on, when we had that first meeting in this room with the State Secretary, the first time the Minister of Kingdom Affairs, actually, and I actually met her, because my Gesprek's partner, my, the person I am allowed to speak to, is the State Secretary of Kingdom Relations. And it took me almost a year and a half to be able to meet the Prime Minister face to face. But we talk regularly now. We talk regularly now. Um, so there's this level of, and I say that again, the little vestiges of colonialism left over for the little islands in the Caribbean. And um, when and if we will give them the attention they need or continue to take them on their fingers because corruption not following the rules, not having everything in place, et cetera, et cetera. So we grow. We are growing in the manner in which we relate in the kingdom. And as more and more international attention is put on this, I'm sure it will continue to improve. We cannot be silent. We cannot be silent. We can, must continue to plot forward. And so in moving forward, 
I don't want to take up too much time because I want to leave time for you to be able to speak. I will pass the floor back to Ayana so that she can continue to direct the proceedings. And I just wish and hope and pray that as we get to the end of where we want to be, that we could put this committee into uh, uh, not just by a ministerial decree, but get it into a legislative body that would be able to exist regardless to which political arm is in charge, then we would have achieved what for me is important. There must be continuity in the fight on this topic as it affects every area of our lives, not just culture, heritage, and education, every single aspect of our lives, every single aspect. Thank you. En voor iedereen die meekijkt of luistert in een andere tijdzone, boemorgel, bon dia, good morning. Hier in het Nationaal Archief spreekt de geschiedenis tot ons in miljoenen documenten. En ook al horen we de ongeschreven stem... is niet alleen maar mooi. Het is vaak ook lelijk, pijnlijk en zelfs ronduit beschamend. Dat geldt zeker voor de rol van Nederland in het slavernijverleden. Wij, levend in het hier en nu, kunnen slavernij alleen in de allerduidelijkste bevordingen erkennen en veroordelen als misdaad tegen de menselijkheid. Als een misdadig systeem dat wereldwijd onnoemelijk veel mensen, onnoemelijk veel en groot leed heeft gebracht. En dat doorwerkt in de levens van mensen hier en nu. En wij in Nederland moeten ons aandeel... ...archief ontmoeten. Hier ligt ons nationale geheugen opgeslagen. Dus dit is de plek voor nationaal gewetensonderzoek. Hier kun je niet om de historische feiten heen. Tot 1814 werden ruim 600.000 tot slaafgemaakte Afrikaanse vrouwen, mannen en kinderen onder erbarmelijke omstandigheden naar het Amerikaanse continent verscheept door Nederlandse slaafhandelaars. De meeste naar Suriname, maar ook naar Curaçao, sint eustatius en andere plaatsen. Ze werden weggerukt uit hun families, ontmenselijkt, als vee vervoerd en behandeld. Vaak onder het overheidsgezag van de West-Indische Compagnie. In Azië werden tussen de 660.000 en ruim 1 miljoen mensen, we weten het niet eens precies... De getallen zijn onvoorstelbaar. Het menselijk leed dat er achter schuil gaat is nog veel onvoorstelbaar. Talloos zijn de overgeleverde verhalen en getuigenissen die bewijzen hoe er in het slavernijsysteem geen maat stond op vreedheid en willekeur. En dus ook geen maat op onrecht en pure angst. We hoeven alleen maar antwoorden. Lees over gezeling en marteling tot de dood erop volgde. Over mensen van wie ledematen werden afgehakt. Over brandmerken in het gezicht. Het lot van de ene persoon nog verschrikkelijker dan van de andere. Op elke pagina onrecht en nog meer onrecht. En zoals Anton de Kom het beschreef voor Suriname, zo gebeurde het ook elders onder hetzelfde Nederlandse overheidsgezag. We lezen het, we weten het, en toch is het afschuwelijke lot van tot slaaf gemaakte mensen, 
nauwelijks te bevatten. Of neem inderdaad de feiten zoals die uit de archieven spreken. Bijvoorbeeld uit de enorme administratie die is omgezet, opgezet rond de afschaffing van de slavernij in 1863 en die hier ingezien kan worden. Pagina na pagina staan daarop per plantage en per slaveneigenaar de namen vermeld van tot slaaf gemaakte plus nog enkele andere persoonlijke gegevens. Zakelijk, systematisch, in een droge opzomming die juist daardoor zo confronterend is. Omdat het de absurditeit onderstreept van een systeem waarin de ene mens... De andere mens. De tot slaaf gemaakten. Het hardvochtige, nog oneerlijker. Want iedereen die in Suriname in 1863 in naam vrij werd, moest gedwongen nog tien jaar lang onder staatstoezicht blijven werken. De facto betekende dat voor velen nog tien jaar langer een leven in onvrijheid, een leven onder dwang. Tot 1873. Komend jaar is dat 150 jaar geleden. Die geschiedenis houdt ons bezig. Een complexe geschiedenis waarin op verschillende plaatsen, verschillende jaartallen en gebeurtenissen betekenis hebben. Niet alleen 1863 en 1873, maar bijvoorbeeld ook 1860, de wettelijke afschaffing van de slavernij in toenmalig Nederlands-Indië. 1814, het jaar dat ook Nederland de transatlantische slavenhandel afschafte. 1848, toen op Sint Maarten de slavernij de facto voorbij was. Of bijvoorbeeld 1795, toen onder leiding van Tula op Curaçao een opstand plaatsvond die nog jaarlijks wordt herdacht. Eindeloos veel momenten, eindeloos veel verhalen, eindeloos veel geschiedenis. Die geschiedenis krijgt de laatste jaren meer aandacht in tentoonstellingen, in publicaties en ook in het maatschappelijk debat. Er vindt maatschappelijke bewustwording plaats. En daardoor ook een verandering in het denken. Dat is goed en terecht en nodig, want te lang is het stilgebleven. dat het niet goed mogelijk is op een betekenisvolle manier verantwoordelijkheid te nemen voor iets dat zo lang geleden is en waar niemand van onszelf bij is geweest. Lange tijd dacht ik dus eigenlijk, het slavernij geleden, dat is geschiedenis die achter ons ligt. Maar ik had het mis. Want eeuwen van onderdrukking en uitbuiting werken door in het hier en nu. In racistische stereotypen. In discriminerende patronen van uitsluiting. In sociale ongelijkheid. En om dat te doorbreken, moeten we ook het verleden open en eerlijk onder ogen zien. Een verleden dat we delen met andere landen. Waardoor onze samenlevingen voor altijd op een speciale manier met elkaar zijn verbonden. Het klopt dat niemand die nu leeft persoonlijk schuld draagt voor de slavernij. Maar het klopt ook dat de Nederlandse staat in al zijn historische verschijningsvormen verantwoordelijkheid draagt voor het grote leed dat tot slaafgemaakten en hun nazaten is aangedaan. En dus kunnen we niet voorbij gaan aan de doorwerking van het verleden in onze tijd. Het rapport Ketenen van het Verleden dat 
Dat rapport verscheen op 1 juli vorig jaar en bevatte een aantal niet mis te verstaande conclusies en aanbevelingen. De drie kernwoorden zijn erkenning, excuses, herstel. Vandaag sturen we de officiële kabinetsreactie naar de Tweede Kamer. Daarin omarmen we de analyse en conclusies van de dialooggroep. In de tussenliggende anderhalf jaar heeft het kabinet op verschillende manieren, op verschillende plekken en met verschillende mensen en groepen over het slavernijverleden gesproken. Ik ben zelf in september jongsleden in Suriname geweest, waar ik heb geleerd hoe diep de geschiedenis nog altijd ingrijpt in het dagelijks per groep en per persoon kunnen verschillen. Het maakt uit of je voorouders uit Afrika werden geroofd of behoorden tot de oorspronkelijke bewoners. Het maakt uit in welk land of regio hun leven zich afspeelde. En het maakt ook uit in welke periode ze leefden. Die historische, geografische en culturele verschillen tussen bevolkingsgroepen en mensen die doen ertoe, ook in het hier en nu. En dat maakt het doen van algemene uitspraken over het slavernijverleden ook zo kwetsbaar. Want hoe doe je recht aan al die verschillen? Wat is daarvoor het beste moment? Hoe doe je recht aan alle spirituele symbolen en rituelen? Zoveel pijn, zoveel gruwelijkheden. Elke poging daartoe zal altijd onvolkomen zijn. En nieuwe vragen en discussies oproepen. Met alle emoties die daarbij horen. Met alle beladenheid. We weten dat er niet één goed moment is voor iedereen. Niet de juiste woorden voor iedereen. Niet één juiste plaats voor iedereen. En ik erken dat de aanloop naar deze dag beter had gekund. Maar laat dat geen reden zijn dan maar niets te doen. Over het slavernijverleden alsjeblieft voeren. Ook als dat... Erkenning van het afschuwelijke leed dat generaties tot slaafgemaakten is aangedaan. Erkenning van en eerherstel voor al die mensen die in het verzet kwamen. Zoals de dappere Marons van Suriname. Ik noem vandaag met eerbied de namen van Tula op Curaçao. Jolicoeur, Boni en Baron in Suriname. Juan T.T. Loke op Sint Maarten. En we gedenken al die naamloos gebleven vrouwen en mannen die door de eeuwen heen heldhaftig de vrijheid zochten. En er vaak op de meest gruwelijke manier voor werden gestraft. En natuurlijk erkenning van historische verantwoordelijkheid. Met de woorden die daarbij horen. Deze woorden. Eeuwenlang hebben de Nederlandse staat en zijn vertegenwoordiger slavernij mogelijk gemaakt, gestimuleerd, in stand gehouden en ervan geprofiteerd. Eeuwenlang zijn de naam van de Nederlandse staat mensen tot handelswaar gemaakt, uitgebuit en mishandeld. Eeuwenlang is onder Nederlands staatsgezag de menselijke waardigheid met voeten getreden, En erkent dat het slavernijverleden een negatieve doorwerking had en heeft. Daarvoor bied ik namens de Nederlandse regering excuses aan.
Today, I apologize. Awe mi tapidi disculpa. Tide mi vani taki pardon. Vandaag bied ik namens de Nederlandse regering excuses aan voor het handelen van de Nederlandse staat in het verleden. Postuum aan alle tot slaaf gemaakten die wereldwijd onder dat handelen hebben geleden. Aan hun dochters en zonen en aan al hun nazaten tot in het hier en nu. We doen dit niet om schoon schip te maken. Niet om staande op de drempel van een belangrijk herdenkingsjaar samen de weg vooruit te vinden. We delen niet alleen het verleden, maar ook de toekomst. Dus zetten we vandaag een comma. Geen punt. Het gesprek over het slavernijverleden moet zo breed mogelijk worden gevoerd. Niet alleen in Nederland, maar juist ook op de plekken waar het gebeurde. Met iedereen die betrokken is of zich betrokken voelt. Daarom klinken de excuses die ik net uitsprak vandaag door op zeven andere plekken in de wereld. Daar waar de pijn en de gevolgen van het slavernijverleden tot de dag van vandaag het meest worden gevoeld en het meest zichtbaar zijn. Ze klinken door in de woorden die worden uitgesproken door zeven vertegenwoordigers van de Nederlandse regering. In Suriname, op Curaçao, op Sint Maarten, op Aruba, op Bonaire, op Saba en op Sint Eustatius. De regering wil in overleg met alle groepen en mensen uit alle landen waarmee wij dit verleden delen, intensiever werken aan meer kennis over het slavernijverleden en dus aan meer bewustwording. En we kunnen het werk alleen in gezamenlijkheid doen. Op weg naar die belangrijke symbolische datum, 1 juli. 2023. Daarna in het hele herdenkingsjaar. En in de jaren die daarop volgen. De kabinetsreactie op het rapport van de dialooggroep Slavernijverleden gaat hier uitvoerig op in. Het belangrijkste is dat we alle stappen die we gaan zetten ook echt gezamenlijk zetten. Heling in het heden. Een comma. Geen punt. Met Suriname, met de Caribische delen van het Koninkrijk en met alle nazaten in Nederland werken we aan zichtbaarheid van erfgoed, aan bewustwording via onderwijs en aan wetenschappelijk historisch onderzoek. Tijdens het herdenkingsjaar zullen alle facetten van het slavernijverleden en de doorwerking in onze tijd in het volle licht staan. De koning voelt zich persoonlijk zeer betrokken bij het onderwerp en zal... ...over 2023 heen. Een onafhankelijk... Een breed samengesteld herdenkingscomité buigt zich over de beste manier om ook in de toekomst waardig en zoveel mogelijk gezamenlijk te herdenken. En dan komt een fonds voor maatschappelijke initiatieven in het hele Koninkrijk en Suriname, waarmee de doorwerking van het slavernijverleden de zichtbaarheid, de aandacht en aanpak krijgt die nodig is. Het helingsproces moet nu beginnen. En het programma daarvoor schrijven we samen. Dames en heren, het boek van onze gedeelde geschiedenis 
kent veel pagina's die ons, levend in de 21e eeuw, met verbijstering en afschuw vervullen. En met diepe schaamte. Die pagina's wissen we met excuses niet uit. En dat is ook niet de bedoeling. We kunnen het verleden niet veranderen. Alleen onder ogen zien. Wat de regering vurig hoopt. Wat ik ook persoonlijk vurig hoop. Is dat, moment, dat dit moment. Dat deze dag ons helpt. Koninkrijksbreed. En samen met Suriname en andere landen. De open pagina's die voor ons liggen, in te vullen met dialoog, erkenning en heling. Dank u wel. Mr. Omar was born in Antigua en Bermuda, graduated from Antigua Grammar School, the and then continued his studies at UWI, Cave Hill, the University of Toronto and Tulane University, where he obtained a Master's of Public Health He is best known as a playwright, director, and producer of theater and music, newspaper magazine columnist, public speaker, and Calypso writer, judge, and analyst. This I did not know. He has created lyrics and melodies for many leading Calypsonians in Antigua and Bermuda. Judge national and regional Calypso competitions, conducted Calypso judging workshops, and written and spoken extensively on Calypso and other aspects of Caribbean culture, and creativity. And he is currently the Vice President of CARICOM Reparation Commission. Please help me welcome Mr. Omar. afternoon. We left the hotel on time, but I think we ran into an open bridge and an accident on the road. And I finally got here with a police escort. First time in my life. <laughs> uh, got us through the traffic. Let me say how grateful and humbled I am by this opportunity to reason with you here today on the history and on the direction of the global reparatory justice movement and the role that the governments and peoples of St. Martin and other countries and the role that the governments and peoples of St. Martin's and other countries of the former Netherlands Antilles are poised to play. Well, not play, but poised to get very serious about their future. The Caribbean movement today is at a most important historical juncture. It is at a point on its upward trajectory that it has never reached before. Approximately three weeks after the Dutch apology, which you know about, which you just heard, and on which I shall focus in a few minutes, the Church of England estimated to have earned approximately 10 billion pounds from its participation in the crime against humanity, also issued an apology for its central role in the enslavement of African peoples, along with the Dutch apology and the Church of England apology. We are talking of major breakthroughs. And it is important that those of us, descendants of the enslaved, brutalized people, manage the future, not only of the implementation of these apologies, but also to capitalize on them through appropriately designed and demands for reparatory justice, for reparations. I've been asked today to address you on the topic, slavery, atonement, and reparations. And to share in the discussion some specifics, including the following. The importance of the apology made by the Dutch state to us as the descendants of enslaved peoples, whether a formal apology 
was actually made and are fully satisfied, why the apology was necessary to lay the grounds for a claim of reparatory justice, and what reparatory justice is by further elaborating on the CARICOM 10-point plan for reparatory justice, and how any advisory committee here in St. Martin can implement the set points in a real and tangible way moving forward. I will not spend time on slavery. Long gone, I think, are the days when we need to delve into the history of that tragic period in the lives of African people. We know that history. Long gone, I think, are the days when we need to debate the Caribbean slavery experience. In 1852, Frederick Douglass dismissed the need for us to argue the details of enslavement. Said he, what? Am I to argue that it is wrong to make men brutes, to rob them of their liberty, to work them without wages? to keep them ignorant of their relations to their fellow man, to beat them with sticks, to flay their flesh with the lash, to load their limbs with irons, to hunt them with dogs, to sell them at auction, to sunder their families, to knock out their teeth, to burn their flesh, to starve them into obedience and submission to their masters. Must I have you, Frederick Douglass asked, that a system thus marked with blood and stained with pollution is wrong? He says, no, I will not. I have better employment for my time and strength than such arguments would imply. I hope we too have better employment of our time. We, are, however, must continue to affirm that the period of enslavement of African peoples in 1501 to 1834, 1838 in the British territories and between, what, 1596 and 1863 plus that 10-year period um, in the Dutch territories, that this period marks without doubt the most ruthless period of the domination of African people by Europeans and establish, and I think this is critical we understand this, because it is that that established the basis for the racial, economic, and political relationships between both peoples, which continue to chastise Africans the world over today. The question of atonement. We have hardly used the term atonement in our discussions and reparations, as both terms atonement and reparations tend to be synonymous. The former, atonement, defined as the action of making amends for a wrong or injury, a concept that tends to be, to be non-specific without international legal definition. More religious, I think, if you ask me. Some thinkers will consider an apology as a form of atonement, which of course brings us to the central point of the discussion here today, the Dutch statement, which we have just heard. And although we did not hear today, I was here on the 19th of December, when I heard and witnessed the very firm response from Prime Minister Jacobs. It is important to note that on the 19th, that that 19th December statement was made by the highest executive official of the Netherlands Kingdom. He deemed it an apology. He recognized, and I quote, the evils of slavery in the clearest possible terms and condemned it as a crime against humanity, as a criminal system which caused untold numbers of people, which caused untold numbers of people 
context of suffering, suffering that continues in the lives of people today. He addressed in his message, he addressed his message to enslaved people in the past, everywhere in the world, their daughters and sons, and to all descendants up to the present day who suffered as a consequence of those Dutch actions. And he then offered an apology. His actual words in the, in the apology, and again I quote, says, today, on behalf of the Dutch government, I apologize for the past actions of the Dutch state, which, and I quote him again, in all its manifestations to history, bears responsibility for the terrible suffering inflicted on enslaved people and their descendants. He described the Dutch actions to which he referred and for which he apologized as the shipment to the American continent in deplorable conditions of more than 600,000 enslaved African women, men, and children, often under governmental authority of the Dutch West Indies Company. He offered a number of promises, and I continue to quote him. That during the year of commemoration, all facets of the history of slavery and its effects upon, and its effects up to the present day will be brought to light. And he says that we will also set up a fund for social in initiatives throughout the kingdom and in Suriname, so that the impact of slavery is given the visibility, attention, and action that is needed. The Prime Minister of the Kingdom finally agreed with the heads of government of Caricom, who wrote to him officially as far back as in 2016, indicating that it was time for the healing process to start. Back then, 2016, he issued the usual milk, water, insulting, and insincere sentiment of profound regret, which is a term they all know and they all love. Um, profound regret for the tragedy of the crime against humanity and his nation's integral part in its commission. At five, that's what, 2016, seven years ago. And so, during that period, that sentiment has changed, that he has moved on behalf of the Dutch government, essentially from this statement of regret to actually using the word an apology. There's been, there's been a a variety of responses, I think, throughout the Dutch diaspora and elsewhere to this apology. The questions are raised. Is the apology sincere? Is it appropriate? Is it satisfactory? Is it of any value without reparations appended to it? Should it be accepted? Should it be rejected? If the Caribbean Reparations Commission sees an apology as a gateway to either negotiated or legal settlement of reparations. Because of the advisory nature of its mandate, advisory to the heads of government countries, the CRC, I will use that term, CRC, Caribbean Reparations Commission, the CRC is not in a position to accept or reject the apology statement, any apology statement of or from any liable nation. As such, however, the CRC, through its chairperson, Professor Sir Hilary Beckers, commended Prime Minister, is it Root or Rute? Rute. 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 
it's, it's, the, the learning process has started. It's a, it's a two way street of Rutter. Um, he commended Prime Minister Rutter for one, acknowledging that the transatlantic slave trade in enchained African bodies and chattel enslavement were crimes against humanity, and two, that the enlightened development of a formal apology that establishes the Netherlands as the European country best poised to bring global leadership to this long and sustained call for justice and which moves us closer to closure in respect of the crippling criminal chapter in human history. The CRC, however, condemned the unilateralism of that historic statement, the absence of the voices of those who are survivors of the crime and called on the Dutch government to ensure that the ongoing approach to healing, recognized as urgently needed also by the Dutch Prime Minister himself, that that approach is imbued with a deeper democratic sensibility. In other words, Dutch government, please understand that the victim communities in the Caribbean must be part of the forecast reparations discussions and settlement. The standing internationally accepted principle that those states liable for crime cannot and do not unilaterally decide on their punishment. And we say that that statement must be regarded. You can't crime, commit crime in any way in this world and then decide what the punishment is going to be. Such is the advice of the CARICOM heads of government, who is, is our advice to the CARICOM heads of government who established the CRC. Such is our advice also to the government of St. Martin. We see reparations as a government to government or a state to state negotiation and understand that it is up to the governments of this region, including the government of St. Martin, to make the decision to accept or reject any apology proffered by any European government. We are, however, not unaware of emerging concepts of international reparations that include direct state to individuals and state to society reparations. As a matter of fact, the CRC right at this moment is faced with reacting to reparations to society from non-state actors, including the possibility of individual to society reparations. I'll explain that what we are facing is that already coming forward as the result of much of the work that we have been doing, we now have individual families coming forward and saying, hey, listen, our family was involved in this estate in Dominica, in Antigua, and from a family point of view, we would like to make reparations, here is X thousand pounds or whatever it is. And so we're faced with that. Are we in a position to accept that? Because in doing that, we would be telling those families or those individuals that yes, you are the daughters and the beneficiaries of the crime, and you yourself are now deciding what the punishment should be. It is quite a dilemma that we're in at this point in time, and it certainly is going to require additional work and additional thinking on our part before we resolve that. However, we think that a formal Dutch apology has been made in that the statement to recognize the role of the Dutch government in the enslavement of Africans. It will recognize the magnitude of the crime 
in approximate numerical detail. It, it recognized the number of Africans kidnapped and transported into slavery. And that statement highlighted the role played by the Dutch government and its servants and its agents in the enslavement process. One of the legal scholars uh, in the CRC has described Rutter's statement as an admission of liability <laughs> for the damage that the centuries of Dutch government criminally caused to enslave Africans and to their present-day descendants. The statement, therefore, is one which we commend, one which I repeat is not a final paragraph, but the preface to a rather large text that defines approaches to either joint reparatory justice negotiations or legal settlement. Which brings us to the future to the necessary organization in St. Martin, and I dare say in other countries in the Dutch Kingdom, to the requirements and activities on our side for preparation for either alternative, either negotiation or legal settlement. I would like to suggest that the people and government of St. Martin have three options before them to secure reparations from the Dutch Kingdom. I emphasize that the option chosen must have its roots deeply in the history of this country, in consultation with all relevant interest groups and persons. The options for consideration, I would suggest, include one, the approach to reparatory justice as defined in the CARICOM Reparations Commission 10-point plan. Two, an approach to decolonization that includes reparations. And three, the approach of the United Nations as expressed to the CERD, the CERD Committee for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, which calls for reparations for racial justice, racial injustice, sorry, for the racial injustice of both capitalism and slavery. So again, one, two, three. One talks about a reparations plan. The other one talks about an decolonization and independence movement. That includes a reparatory justice claim. And the third one sets itself up as calling for reparations for the racial injustice caused to African peoples through both capitalism and slavery. In reality, however, there's a fourth option. Because in all planning scenarios that we know of, there's always the do nothing option. In this case, it is an option that would have our ancestors rolling in their graves. And one which will condemn our progeny to the victimhood of persistent myriad contemporary structures of racial discrimination and oppression. Let's go through these three alternatives. Of course, I don't have time for full detail, um, but at least let, let, let's see what we can do, I mean, in the period allotted here to me. So let's start with the CRC, the CARICOM 10-point plan. The CARICOM reparations, just a little background, was established by and advisory to the heads of government of the Caribbean community. And the Caribbean community I refer to is a community of 15 member states, 14 of which are politically independent, three of which are on the America's mainland, 
all except Suriname, are former British colonies. The chairpersons of national commissions established in those territories sit on the CRC. So I sit there as the representative of the Antigua and Barbuda Reparation Support Commission. A number of non-governmental regional organizations, however, has been admitted recently as associate members. The CRC is guided by international law protocols that define reparations as the redress for gross systemic violations of human rights law and humanitarian law. And we understand that in keeping with UN mandates, that the most common forms of reparations are restitution, compensation, <coughs> rehabilitation, satisfaction, and the guarantee of non-repetition, all seeking to bring reconciliation between the victims and the beneficiaries of the crime. The various forms have the same aim. They all geared towards this process of repairing the consequences of crimes committed against our people, to heal, to atone, and, and to bring closure to the human tragedy of mass slavery. They all seek to restore a higher moral order, a higher moral international order, by removing the shame and the guilt that persistently poison the relationships between descendants on all sides of the crime. I come from a country that has been independent since 1981. And it's coming here the last couple of months that I begin to, 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 to sense that people my age have forgotten what colonialism is about. It is. I, I listen to Prime Minister, I listen to my colleagues, Shusha Rao sitting here, Sister Rhoda was somewhere in the back, I don't know if she's still with us. But when I listen to my colleagues discussing, to the Prime Minister and my colleagues discussing what colonialism is, is something I think that we are forgetting. Um, you see, the reparatory justice sort of requires that those seeking reparations establish first that the crime, what we discuss as the crime, the gross violation of human rights law and humanitarian law, that that took place. And I think we can say from our own history, our own understanding, and from the words of the Prime Minister of the Kingdom, that that crime did take place. We feel it today. Well, exactly. Prime of the Netherlands. Sorry. Of the Netherlands. And that the crime can be connected as contributory to ongoing human rights harm and injury. The CRC has defined that crime in the CARICOM context for which we seek reparations as the slave trade, slavery, and the genocide of indigenous peoples. We assert that European governments, including and in many cases led by the Dutch government, committed crimes against humanity in that one, they were owners and traders of enslaved Africans. They instructed genocidal actions upon indigenous communities. They created legal, financial, and fiscal policies necessary for the enslavement of Africans. They defined and enforced African enslavement and native genocide as in their national interests. They refused compensation to the enslaved with the ending of the enslavement. They compensated slave owners at emancipation for the loss of legal property rights, their legal property rights in enslaved Africans. 
They imposed a further 100 years of racial apartheid upon the emancipated. They imposed another 100 years of policies dis dis designed to perpetuate suffering upon the emancipated and survivors of the genocide, and they have refused to acknowledge such crimes or to compensate victims and their descendants. We have at least one half of a step so far that the British government has acknowledged the crime. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm still in my British, my British frame. Uh, I apologize. As the heads of the CARICOM government to the CRC has issued the CARICOM Justice Program and the CARICOM 10-point plan for reparatory justice, in which it has defined within the areas and or sectors of the regional development agenda the ongoing human rights harm and injury caused by the crime of the slave trade, slavery, and genocide of indigenous people. That plan further defines in broad terms the remedies for healing. The plan provides the basis for reparatory justice negotiations between CARICOM and European nations responsible for the damage. It is a, a development plan as contrasted to the lineage plans that are developing in other parts of the diaspora where reparations are seen and is being defined as in terms of direct benefits to individuals. Um, there are a number of plans now emerging uh, in the United States, among black folks in the United States. And those plans are calling for direct payments to me as a descendant of an enslaved person. Here is $10, here is $500,000, whatever the figure is, and this is your reparation. And each of you can do whatever you want to do with it. The plan addresses the following areas. It calls for a full formal apology. It calls for the development of an indigenous people's development program. It calls for repatriation, a fully funded resettlement program for those who wish to return to the continent. It calls for the establishment of cultural institutions and the return of cultural heritage in the museums and research centers. It calls for assistance in remedying the public health crisis, for education programs, for the enhancement of historical and cultural knowledge exchanges. It calls also for psych psychological rehabilitation as a result of the transmission of trauma. It calls for the, the right to development through the use of technology. And finally, it calls for debt cancellation and monetary compensation. That is the 10-point plan. Maybe I can elaborate a bit on that, maybe through question time instead of. Uh, yeah. So go ahead. OK. Let me just take a uh, Let me just identify a couple. I won't go through all 10. Well, the first one the call for the formal apology. Yeah, that, that, that does not need much. Um, the Indigenous Peoples Development Program. We think when Europeans arrived in this region, there were about three million indigenous people sailing up and down these islands. We call them, call them Caribs and Arawaks or something. But essentially, we're talking about the Kalinaga people. In 2000, when a, sen when a census was done, there are only about 30,000 of them left in this region. In Dominica, um, certainly Guyana, Suriname, Belize. Uh, like a Holocaust, you mean? Exactly. That's the point. 
We're talking genocide. genocide yes. This is what we're talking about, genocide. Most of those folks are living in not very acceptable conditions. Some of them virtually still on reservations, if you want to use that term, very poor settlements across this region. And we are calling reparations to remedy that situation for indigenous people. Um, talking about repatriation as a fully funded resettlement program for those who wish to return to Africa. This gets included in the CARICOM 10-point plan for justice because of the importance of the Rastafari in this region that has been the defenders of the call for reparations from <laughs> since the 1930s. In, without, without a break, this call from the time that movement has been established has been in the forefront of this. And what it simply says is that we are a kidnapped people. You took us from Africa, and we're talking about a program to get us back. Not necessarily a program where we're talking about paying passage or that type of thing. What we're really talking about are those policy possibilities, the policy organizations that will make return to the continent comfortable. We are estimating that there are about, I guess, just a little less than 20,000 Caribbean people scattered across the various countries on the continent. Um, the main settlement in Shashamana in Ethiopia, where we find large numbers of Rastafarians who have actually gone back to Ethiopia. But the conditions are not acceptable. There are problems with work permits, there are problems with housing, problems with land ownership, problems with education for children, but problems. They still exploited that. You know how it is. Problems, <laughs> problems about you know, health, etc. And so what we're really talking about when we're talking about those policy issues for resettlement is the call for that a, a, a funded program that will help our policymakers to deal with policymakers on the continent and establish proper conditions under which those of us who wish to return can do so without major, major problems. Um, assistance, remedying the public health crisis. Uh, I do have a health background. <laughs> I might want to talk about this for a long time, but I'm not going to. What we are saying today is that there are specific health conditions in this region, primarily hypertension and type 2 diabetes that do not exist, the prevalence of which do not exist anywhere else in the world, except perhaps in Mississippi. <laughs> and we know why. Because we are talking about the same conditions, the same conditions of overwork, undernutrition, or badly nourished, um, it's about salt, meat, and sugar. To the point that Caribbean people, in general, 60% of us over 60 years of age have diabetes or hypertension or both. Barbados, for example, is known in the world as the diabetic foot capital that there are more amputations going on there per population than anywhere else in the world. And we are saying that that is a direct result of slavery. And that is the transmission of that trauma that has continued generation after generation until we are at this point. And we are saying that there is need for reparations to remedy that. A little more about that, that history. It's because I think work has gone on at the University of the West Indies, and what we have discovered is although that there may be access to, 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 to medication, that the medication that most of us are using has only about a 70 to 75 efficacy on the African DNA. Yeah. 
really tested on European DNA, where those same drugs essentially have a 90 to 95 efficacy. I think our, our researchers have said to the companies, uh, listen, if you were to just tweak a molecule here and a molecule there and a little bit of magic or whatever it is, <laughs> in that formula, it will become a lot more effective on our African DNA and save about a thousand lives a year in this region. And the companies, you know, guided by the law of the pocket, the, the companies have simply said, it's going to cost us a couple billion dollars to redo that research and set up new manufacturing, et cetera. And can we do that for five million people living in this Caribbean? Because we're doing different they, no, these are the companies themselves, you know. And so the, the position we hold in the CRC is that it is reparation funds that must be able to fund the preparation of adequate, appropriate drugs for those of us who continue to suffer from hypertension and, high, high, uh, hypertension and diabetes. This does not in any way negate the personal responsibility we have for proper nutrition and diet and running on the beach and, 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 and not lifting weights and all sorts of things to help to ward off the disease. It does not negate that because we admit that also is needed among our Caribbean people. Um, that's uh, uh, what, 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 what's another? Yes. No? The debt. I may mention a little later in this talk that, and I will say it here and perhaps repeat it a bit later, that the result of the independence model that we in the British Caribbean have accepted, it's a model that is funded, it's a development model that is funded through debt to borrowing. About a decade ago, there were three Caribbean territories in the 10 most indebted countries in this world. And so when we call here for debt cancellation, we are really talking very large sums of money. All our countries are deeply in debt. Um, I guess Guyana finding oil is creeping out of it. Um, but the others, deeply in debt. And we are saying that that debt, too, has come from the conditions, the horrible conditions under which colonialism was ended um, in the British colonies without any development assistance to plug your way forward. The conditions we are talking about of poor education and ill health, that the advances that have been made by our governments generally in attempting to remedy those um, colonial injuries have been made through debt. We're talking question time. Okay. Yeah. And so the, the question of debt is, is, is clearly one that's very important to us. I'll talk a bit about that later. Um, so let me move on. So that is the that is the first option. Um, that the advisory committee models its approach to reparations on that model. The second option I place before you is the decolonization model. You would have noted that although the CRC 10-point plan is couched in an anti-colonial thinking, it does not in any systematic way focus on decolonization. For the simple fact that only one of its 15 members is a colony, Montserrat remains a colony. 
It is therefore the model issued, emanating from an independent nation mindset. Reparation advocacy and struggle in a colonial setting, I think, must face two questions, which I paraphrase. One, how could a people demand reparations when they are not free to be themselves? And how could a people find dignity if they are ashamed of their identity and cultural heritage? The history of, the point I was making just a few seconds ago, the history of independence in the British Caribbean shows a progression to a British construct called associated status, a quasi-colonial relationship with Britain, not dissimilar, in my reading, to the present relationship of St. Martin to the kingdom, to the Netherlands kingdom. And one, therefore, from which I think St. Martin could learn, I'm talking about the associated states status that the small islands in the Caribbean went through, and I'm talking about a similarity in the situation. Between 1974, starting in Grenada, and ending in 1983 in St. Kitts and Nevis, our national leaders in the British um, colonies sought closure to colonial status through political agreements. They had noted the harsh, insulting response of the British government to the demands of Jamaica in the first instance, and then Trinidad and Tobago for what was then referred to as a golden handshake that our leaders, Bustamante, Eric Williams, etc., on achieving, uh, approaching independence, all went to Britain and says, hey man, we have been in your colonies for long, this, this, this. We need X amount of pounds to build our development. And they were all insulted and driven away. Um, if you, uh, Professor Hilary Beckles has just published a book called How Britain Owned and Developed the Caribbean. It is a wonderful reading to understand how European countries have really treated this region and forced them into underdevelopment. And so none of those leaders got anything. No, they were really asking for reparations, although they did not use that term. They were talking about golden handshake. They got none. So independence is now, um, in many ways too, being foisted on the smaller territories from 1974, and they all accepted independence without a golden handshake. So that the territories of what is now known as the OECS, the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, entered independence without the means to finance their development. The result of the flawed independence process can be seen today. All are burdened by large external debt from which they source the development funds. Importantly, most have living standards that are not particularly financial better than their existing neighboring colonies. It is this reality which we consider as a hindrance to the decolonization movement in the world. The colonies scattered across this region. Dutch colonies, North American colonies, British colonies, French colonies, all these still exist. We are perhaps the, the, the concentration of colonies in the Caribbean is the largest anywhere in the world. And we are saying that this exists this despite a mid-1950s call of the United Nations for decolonization. It seems that many 
in the colonies are prepared to accept the indignity of colonial status in exchange for the standard of living provided to colonially administrated donations and grants and aids and one of one, one of and, and passports. Somebody said that I should add passports to that discussion. The CRC asserts that colonial governments, those European governments, have a responsibility after hundreds of years of slavery and colonization to assist the movement of these colonies and people towards independence and therefore visualizes a development model built on what we refer to as, a comp as compensated national independence. The strategy of which includes one, reparatory justice for the descendants of the enslaved, and two, a reparations funded investment framework to confront and uproot the post-slavery, post-indentured poverty that afflicts the vast majority of colonial populations. So that this option for consideration of any reparation advisory group, um, and of course, for consideration of the government of St. Martin, it moves the struggle in this option, it moves the struggle from a direct reparations focus, as in the CARICOM 10-point plan, it moves it to a decolonization struggle, demanding independence with the support over the next two or three decades of a reparations-funded development plan designed to maintain and improve the standard of living here in St. Martin. The approach to the 10-point plan, that is the ongoing, the identification of the ongoing injury and the associated remedies for healing, that approach remains relevant, I think, to this option, to the second option. And just again for clarification, it moves it from the CRC reparations focus, the second option now talks about an independence focus with full support of reparations. There's a third option that I, I put here. And the third option is the option as, as enunciated in the United Nations by the Committee for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, the CERT. Um, and I urge, urge members of the advisory group to give serious attention to the report of the Special Rapporteur on Contemporary Forms of Racism, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia, and Racial Intolerance, issued in the United Nations, the 74th session, August 2019. It calls essentially for the elimination of racial racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and, and related intolerance, and calls for comprehensive implementation and follow-up of the Durban Declaration and Plan of Action. I know I'm trying out a couple of things here. The Durban Declaration that's mentioned is the result of a 2001 um, a 2001 conference held in Durban, South Africa, that looked at this issue of racism and came down with a program of action for confronted racism throughout the world. I know this is a rather detailed and technical, technical approach, but in essence, it identifies the ongoing hurt as racial injustice resulting from both slavery and colonialism, and therefore urges member states of the United Nations to take the following into consideration. That the historic racial injustices of slavery and colonialism 
that remain largely unaccounted for today, but which nevertheless require restitution, compensation, satisfaction, rehabilitation, and guarantees of non-repetition to take those historical racial injustices of slavery into account. And two, that the contemporary racially discriminatory effects of the structures of inequality and subordination resulting from failures to redress the racism of slavery and colonialism. Now you see where I'm going, I'm going with this. The third option simply says that the battle we face must be a battle against racial injustice. And that racial injustice emanates from both slavery and colonialism. Yep. And so this option, remember where we started? We started with a reparation option. Then we started with an independence and reparations option. And now we're in a third option, which the focus is on racial injustice caused by those two other aspects we were talking about, slavery and colonialism. There's a lot of reading, I think, to be done on this. Um, that, that certainly I am, and, and, and in many, many ways, I'm not that particularly knowledgeable, knowledgeable of that. But I can understand clearly what that process would be like. So in summary, that this option posits that reparations for slavery and colonialism include not only justice and accountability for historical wrongs, but also the eradication of persistent structures of racial inequality, which is what we're talking about when we're talking about colonialism, essentially. The General Assembly of the UN has condemned colonialism in its human rights system, including in the UN Declaration on the CERD that I mentioned earlier, also in the International Convention and the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, and also in the UN Declaration on the Right to Development. The conclusion, therefore, is that reparations for racial discrimination rooted in colonialism and slavery are essential in the fulfillment of human rights. So it's a human rights focus that we're talking about here at this point in time. The UN urges member states, including, of course, the Netherlands, to accept that they have obligations and responsibility to make reparations to victims and their descendants. The option, therefore, focuses human rights and racial discrimination as the focus of the struggle, addressing the harm of both slavery and colonialism in a single context, with the aim of achieving racial equality through reparation and other means. In conclusion, it is obvious there that any reparatory advisory group, and um, I amend to this talk uh, for Prime Minister Jacobs, I amend the mandate and the structure of the CRC as an example, essentially. Um, but that that group not only has much work to do, but it must do it quickly. It must do it quickly within a historical context and in collaboration with the thinking of St. Martinus as expressed through their civil society groups, through their media practitioners, through their academics and other professionals, through their development experts, and of course through the political director. I urge haste, I urge urgency. We cannot allow the opportunity presented by the apology of the Dutch government to linger into disregard through inaction on our part. <laughs> History must never see us 
as delaying reparations. Yeah. I say we, and I say our, and I say us, not in error, but in recognition that the actions here and in other parts of the kingdom and territories will have tremendous impact on the thinking and direction of the CARICOM struggle itself and also the approach of other European enslaving and colonizing countries and organizations. It's an immense responsibility, I think, that's been trust on St. Martin um, through that apology statement. I again uh, express my thanks for the opportunity here to exchange ideas with you. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I was just signing off. <laughs> uh, to, to exchange ideas with you and the, this tremendous honor, I, I think, it bestows on the CARICOM Reparations Commission and, of course, on myself. I, I thank you very much. Can we have a round of applause again for Mr. Emory? St. Martin, after that, all I can say is that we have work to do. We have a lot of work to do. At this particular juncture, I wanted to touch um, base on the advisory committee on slavery, atonement, and reparations. And pretty much the structure will be similar to other committees, but what's important for us and for Prime Minister is the longevity of this committee. We don't want to just simply establish a committee that fades fades away if there's a new arm or branch of government in charge. We actually want this committee, this committee to be enshrined to some extent in law, whether that's by our foundation or the establishment of the entity. Now, how that procedure goes about will be based on the committee themselves. So we will give them the mandate, we will establish a committee, and the mandate and the responsibility will be on the committee itself to execute the various tasks and to present proposals and suggestions to the government of St. Martin on the step moving forward. Our ultimate goal is to have um, a position paper presented before the, the Nederlands on how we perceive reparatory justice and what we would require from that point moving forward. Now, I do not have all the answers, as you can see. <laughs> uh, we do not have all the answers, but we are open to learning and growing and doing the necessary research and work that is required to obtain the answers that will best serve the people of St. Martin. So if anyone had any questions in relation to the advisory committee in itself, maybe just the structure, I've learned some new points as it relates to Dr. Uh, Mr. Omar's presentation that I think we definitely would need to incorporate in the mandate that we're giving to the committee members, perhaps exploring all three points as it relates to repertory justice or the plan of action, whether that's CARICOM's plan, the decolonization plan, and the um, UN's plan of approach. But that will, be the, that will be determined by the committee board members on which way they think would be best for us to move forward. Any questions on this particular point? And then we can open up the floor to questions overall. Uh, like I said, um, first of all, I want to thank all you for putting this together. Like I said, I see a lot of women here, not enough men, but at least the women stepped up to the plate to make the move as usual in St. Martin, you know? So um, I wanted to know for the viewers and the people asking questions too, and you know, the men that are hiding in the background, um, how do we get more involved in this committee and whatnot? And also for a question for you, I think somebody said something about 200,000 to join the carry car or something like that. Mm -hmm. There is, I don't know what the figure is, but the Prime Minister said 200,000. Okay, but there's okay. a contribution because a, it supports the work. It, is the, it supports, it supports the work of character. No, if we can't afford that right away, we could still play a big part in St. Martin or so on. Well, you have to take that <laughs> <laughs> well, we can work on that so the answer to your first question is we have a sign-up sheet for anyone that's interested in becoming a committee member or a subcommittee member. 
to put down their contact information and details and we will re reach out to said individuals. And as it relates to CARICOM, we have different projects that we work with CARICOM with already. So there are certain elements that we liaise and work with CARICOM with sub subgroups, but to become associate members, we will need to pay that fee for sure. Per year. Per year. <laughs> but it's not a fee, it's a contribution. A contribution. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for your presentation. In terms of the committee, a couple of questions. Um, mm -hmm. One, around how big do you think the committee uh, will be in terms of how many people are you looking for? Um, two, will it be a paid position? Because uh, just judging from the presentation today, it's going to be a lot of research, mm -hmm. a lot of work, a lot of hours. So mm -hmm. um, is there going to be a stipend available for the people who are on the committee? Um, three, how are you going to ensure that there is a good representation of different um, professionals on the committee to make sure that the options being presented are valid? Um, I think those are the three points. Can you run the three points again? I got the last one, but repeat the first two. Oh, one, <laughs> one was how big the committee. Okay, so let me answer that question, per question. Um, so the executive board of the association foundation or entity, depending on how the, found, how the committee decides they're gonna move forward, we're looking at potentially eight to nine members sitting on that, and then they will have subcommittees. As it relates to a stipend, we would love to, um, <laughs> to to pay them, yes. <laughs> I'll let the prime minister answer that part of the question. <laughs> so of course, um, for the initial work, a lot is available. Let's say internationally, once it's established and we have the the core tasks and a plan of action, etc. But in terms of the start up, government will initially um, determine with the help of the committee, what type of a stipend for the initial work, and of course government will have to take that up. We don't know how yet, that's part of the problem, but we find money for other things, so we will indeed um, find ways to um, fund the stipends for the initial start up. Um, however, we believe that the work is going to be so long that it will require sustained funding yes. and um, internationally and of course in listening to the discussions that have been brought forth, funding will be available for this type of a committee, whether through international or even from the perpetrators themselves. So we will see how it goes. Um, we, will, we will see and all of this is, is literally the work that will come out of the committee in the best way possible. The committee initially will consist of, when we look at the criteria, persons who not only culture and heritage, but also um, there will be a representative from the Ministry of General Affairs and ECYS. There will be from the private sector, community-based organizations, from the economic slash finance sector, health sector, and as I mentioned, culture and heritage sector. Because as I said in my opening words, it's across the board. And when people first heard it, they thought only the culture and heritage people would be involved. But especially, I didn't get to stick to my notes in the opening, the whole psychosocial impact, the trauma has to be dealt with. So not only health, but psychosocial um, professionals will also be invited to be part of the committee, youth as well. And so the subcommittees will be important. So you may not be on the main committee, but in the stakeholder engagement, then you'll be invited you know, to form part of the discussion to reach towards uh, whatever the, in, the, the goal or task may be. So that breakdown was the nine? Like, that that, that was the initial, was yeah. Okay, and uh, will there be a representative from law as well? Let, yes, it's not, it's yes. Legal. Yes, legal as well, of course. All right. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much, sir, for that enlightening presentation. Thank you, Prime Minister and your cabinet for hosting this information session. My name is Ife Banajo. I have a question about um, the repatriation to Africa mm -hmm. and it being fully funded. Um, part of the discussion as it pertains to slavery colonization 
is to ensure that the gap between Africa and the diaspora remains systemically. Um, that can be through many different ways. For example, they've closed off uh, Africa to do exporting to the rest of the world in many different regards, um, things of that nature. So my question is, what are some of the steps to bridge that gap? So not only that is rep repatriation from mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the diaspora mm -hmm. to Africa, but also enticing, uh, engaging, and welcoming Africans over to this site, because not all of us want to be able to go to the African continent, but we want to build the relationships. So that's my first question. And then my second question, as it pertains to uh, the third option of dealing with capitalism and slavery. Um, yes, racial injustice. Thank you so much. Yeah. Racial injustice. Uh, with capitalism and no, actually, sorry, Condom. it's option one. But the point as it pertains to uh, development through technology—that's mm -hmm. actually where my brain was going. But I okay. said that the capitalism. Number. <laughs> so um, I wanted to know more about that. It, how does that develop? What does that look like? Uh, because also the digital divide currently is widening the economic divide, which is also systemic from colonialism and slavery. So I would like to know what are some of the steps in that regard. Two very important questions here. The first one about the relations between, let's say, the Caribbean and the continent. In the CRC, our attempt over the last, I would say, the last two years has been towards the establishment of a global reparations movement. And we have recognized the importance of Africa, the important role that the African continent of the number of 54 African countries can play in the development of that global reparations <coughs> movement. And so we have been reaching out in many, many ways, many different levels, at NGO levels, at government levels also, for particularly about reparations, which of course is our concern. To the extent that in August of last year, the government of Kenya called an international reparations conference. And the outcome of that conference is a statement that Ghana, Kenya, and a number of other countries is recommending, I think either this week or next week, to the African Union that reparations be brought fully on the agenda. And this is also important um, because it's really complete in a circle that the modern call for reparations, and when I say modern, mid-1990s, actually came out of the continent that they established a group of eminent persons um, led by um, uh, eminent gentleman Abiola, who's his name. They established an eminent persons group to look at the questions of reparations for both Africa and for the diaspora. That group included at least one Caribbean person um, from Jamaica, don't pin me on names, please. My head doesn't go there so often. But I remember that Dudley, Dudley Thompson. Baba Dudley Thompson was a member of that group. And so it's in recognition of that also that we are talking serious reparations with Africa and the African countries. At another level, we have signed, just signed an MOU and have been participating in the programs of a group called AIDO, A-I-D-O, the Attica International Development Organization, which is an organization of kings and queens on the continent, an organization of African royalty. It's amazing the number of kingdoms that still exist. I think there are over 700 and something kingdoms still functioning on the continent. And so we are making contacts with the leadership, the, the, the kingship and the queenship of all those kingdoms and disseminating a reparations message to them. 
to the extent that we have we participated in their last meeting. When they came out to the Americas, their last meeting was in September in Atlanta, Georgia, and we all participated in it. I actually presented there also. And now we're getting ready to go to Kenya for their next convention, which is at the end of May. We have been pushing very, very seriously our governments towards establishing at, at least air communications, direct air communications between the Caribbean and, and Africa. I mean, this is an old talk. This talk has been going on for a very, very long time. Recently, the Antigua and Barbuda government signed an agreement with a Nigerian company and established Antigua Airways that now has charter flights, direct charter flights between Nigeria and Antigua. So we see something is moving. The other governments, the government of Barbados, um, government of Guyana have signed air services agreements with, I think, Rwanda and with Ghana also. And so the, those possibilities of developing those routes, you know, also exist. So yeah, it's ongoing work. It's work that we recognize is very, very important. And very, very quickly, the whole question of the development through technology, because you've recognized the impact of what is now termed as the, develop, the digital divide. Uh, that is widening be between. I mean, w w those of us um, who, who observe, I, I think, the levels of technology in our countries, you know, some, some of us feel quite good about it. But when you recognize that what we are talking about are actions of 10-year-olds and 12-year-olds in the development world, that we really not that advanced as far as the technology is today. And, you know, we blame our teachers, blame our governments, but I think that there's something even more intrinsic in us as a people exposed to colonization. In the British territories, all of the, through the colonial period up to independence, there is a standing British position that not even a nail is to be made in our territories. That through slavery, through colonization, we were divided, distracted, separated from technology at any level. So that what we are witnessing in many ways is a result, is an injury, is an ongoing injury from those types of colonial edicts. And so we are also calling for reparations to deal with that because that is, it, it is the colonial edicts that have really separated us from technology. And we need that technology for development in this world today, for sure. First of all, thanks for the lightning uh, introduction that you got, because this was the first session. Mm -hmm. so thank you for yeah. being the first session. And I think that we need much more sessions. Mm -hmm. And what I would like to ask is the following. If basically we will talk and we have to talk about racial injustice, it should be racial equality, racial justice, then we don't have to wait until reparations will be internationally legislated. Because right now, based on human rights, we are entitled to equal treatment in every state. Now, in the relation from an independent state with the former colonizers, that demand has been lost by the British ex-colonies. It's not lost by the French territories, and it has not been lost by the Dutch territories. So, Prime Minister, rather than <coughs> looking into a committee that imitates a little bit of what the CARICOM <coughs> has 
extrapolations from which it has provided, isn't it something for us to think about that we actually come with a community that first and foremost puts forward equality, right and no, and we still can go for the rest of the reparations back till colonialism <coughs> and brought us together. I don't know if you could respond on that from your CARICOM experience in the reparations committee. Thank you. If you could. If not, no problem. We will continue our discussion. I, I really don't have a specific response to it. Clearly, another option put on the table. And I think it fits one of the options. Yeah, with the third option. Yeah, so third option. It's something yeah. for the committee to discuss, come forward with in terms of what's the best way forward. Yeah. I don't want to dictate. Yeah. Um, uh, but thank you for your contribution. And hopefully, once the committee is finalized, they will take the helm to continue with these informative sessions. Yeah. Thank you, Prime Minister, and thank you, okay. Speaker. Okay. Let me come to my question fast. An advisory committee now looking to the future. When I look at the present composition of our societies, take for example, Suriname is one of the 15 CRC members. That's right. They have a multi-ethnic society. St. Martin, according to anthropologists, have about 70% newcomers. Ah. How do we deal with this reparation issue in the present composition of our societies? As Suriname is part of the CRC with a multi-ethnic society, maybe there are experiences and ideas to share with St. Martin, who have 70% newcomers. <laughs> this is not a joke. <laughs> it's certainly not a joke. It's, it, it's a serious matter. I think the answer lies in our uh, approach to reparations as a development plan and not a linear plan, as I mentioned. And so what we are talking about, as far as a development plan is concerned, let's say it's development of education institutions in the state of St. Martin. The development of hospital services and clinics, et cetera, in St. Martin from which everyone will benefit. I think that that is, that, that is the approach we have taken talking development and a development agenda. Now, you, you, you mentioned Suriname, for example, seven, eight ethnic groups, if you want to call them that. How that is dealt with both in Suriname and dealt with in Guyana is that there is representation on the National Reparations Commission of these various groups expressing their needs and their interests through the National Commission. And so I don't know if there are newcomer groups here in St. Martin that will deserve representation on the National Advisory Committee. I am sure that there may be some way that the political thinkers, et cetera, can get around that particular issue. But I think it's important to understand that we talk a development plan, that even the children of the colonizers, if they live in our countries, can benefit from it. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the very interesting uh, lecture that you just gave us. My name is John Berenger Scott. I'm a retired dentist of St. Martin, fourth, fifth generation. And I happen to have the privilege, if you want to call it, to have Chinese talks with a freed slave, my great-grandfather. After reading the uh, reparation segment from the uh, committee, mm -hmm. I wrote to them and I said, the United Nations in around 2000 did a research pertaining to the way the colonizers got their slaves. Because we are not speaking about 10 or 100 
persuade them to go pick up hundreds. I mean, we chatted about them, but we speaking about, as you said, hundred thousands of them. They have to come from somewhere. And my question is, how is that being uh, addressed? And I got an answer from them, and they said it will be discussed. It will be the discussed in coming discussions pertaining to this slavery business. And I more or less missed it in your presentation, if it was necessary. I believe that as descendants of such ill-treated ancestors, we should be more one. We should be more protective and respective of each other. That's my opinion. Very good. Yeah. A, a response to that. Well, what, what, what I think um, that this Scott borders on here is a major challenge that we face in the Reparations Commission of dealing with this concept and this myth of Africans selling Africans. <laughs> it's a very troubling it's a very troubling position that continues to be trust upon us. Because the history of Africa and the history of slavery and the way the slavery process happened, essentially, I don't think is well known. To the extent that we call in July, June or July this year, the Caracom Reparations Commission is calling a regional meeting, a regional symposium to fully discuss this issue. Let me stand up. <laughs> the attempt over the last two, three decades by Europe is to turn the European slave trade into the African slave trade. Well, let's look at the whole process. And what we have done on the basis of researchers, we have divided this process into about six legs to explain what slavery is about. The first leg is the demand for labor in, on the plantations here in the region established by Europeans. The very first leg, the demand for labor. This is a European responsibility. The second leg is the preparation, the planning for that journey to Africa. To buy the ships, the insurance companies, the financing, to get the sailors, to get the captains on board, to get food supplies, etc. That's completely European. There's absolutely no African agency in this. Royalty involved. The third leg is activities on the continent itself. And the activities on the continent is what we really need to look at very carefully. Started with kidnapping. Do not dismiss that, then the government has got. But then afterwards, it develops into a situation where guns, it develops into the biggest terrorist happening that this world has known. It happens overwhelming guns and warfare. And I know that we can talk about African agency, but let's be real. If I put a gun before you and tell you, listen, you either go and get Prime Minister Jacobs with me, or you come with me to that ship. Prime Minister Jacobs in trouble. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I come into that too. That's the third leg. The fourth leg that we identify is the transatlantic trip. No African agency in that. The fifth leg is what happens on the plantations here in this Caribbean. There's no African agency in that. It's all European. And of course, the sixth leg is the repatriation of the profits back to Europe. 
So I am suggesting to you that five of the six legs of that slave trade is European. And, 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 and therefore, we should just dismiss completely this whole attempt to make that enterprise an African enterprise. That African people sold African, and that is how slavery came. And the question the brother just asked us, where is the supposed wealth in Africa from the slave trade? We can trace the wealth from, from the trade all across Europe. We can trace that. As a matter of fact, of the 20 million pounds that the British government paid the plantation owners and enslavers in this country for what they considered the loss of property, African bodies, of that 20 million pounds, the University of Cambridge has traced about 90% of it today and can tell you which family, yeah. which business received of that 90 million pounds. Nobody can show us the African well that emanated from this because there was none. <clears throat> So I'm going to try to keep the question as brief as possible. I really enjoyed the direction that the discussion went tonight. Um, but one of the things that I missed, and maybe that's because of my professional background, is really focusing on the psychological trauma of slavery and what that has done, not only to our ancestors, but what it continues to do for us today. You mentioned very briefly the 10 points mm -hmm. of the 10 points. That's right. How would you advise the committee that the government of St. Martin would like to um, establish for us, how would you advise the committee and its members to ensure that they give sufficient um, attention to the, I think it's the eighth point, where yeah. we establish um, programs for dealing with the psychological trauma yeah. of slavery? I think you just did. <laughs> <laughs> in the introduction, <laughs> um, the basis of the advisors would be to establish a committee was based on, and I quote, the advisory committee is tasked with exploring the institutional, financial, educational, judicial, sociological, psychological, spiritual, and emotional impact of slavery past on the people of St. Martin through the school of thought of post-traumatic slave syndrome. Yeah. Okay. So that was the premise for the start of this. But okay. in the fact that so much was going to be disseminated and the committee still had to be finalized in terms of the human beings, um, I decided to omit it. But clearly it was needed, so thanks for bringing it up. Yes. And I did mention it briefly in terms of that persons on the committee would have to have, that profile was covered, is covered. Yeah, okay. that's very good. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for the great presentation. And I think the information cannot be disseminated, disseminated enough to inform our society. Um, one comment, I think it's an unfortunate that more MPs and our ministers are not present because it touches the whole government. Um, and then my question, of course, on one end extends um, to the, no, the Prime Minister. In your particular experience with the Dutch government, um, especially, especially the Prime Minister, 
what is then the vision for this government in terms of the options presented? I know you mentioned the committee, the committee, but I think it's important for our leaders to have a vision of what that will look like, considering especially those close to the operation and the actual workings of what this kingdom looks like. You know, and from that experience, I would like you to elaborate for us what your vision is or from the government. I can only give options. you my vision at this point, because as I mentioned, this has not been discussed in depth on a governmental level. But in my experience as Prime Minister, I won't call it my personal experience because I believe this experience has been had by all. Not all were as transparent with the public as to how it goes. But I refuse, and I can remember in the early days of 2020, when we were dealing with this discussion on what we were being offered in the midst of the trauma and the drama, was that a key young advisor said, this is an abusive relationship. Yes. Whereby, and why abused persons don't speak out? Because it is done in secret. Yes. It is done in secret. And diplomacy <laughs> requires, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But basically, in the 2020, when I mentioned that this is discriminatory, the actions that were being enforced at the time, that this is colonial behavior, and this gives a very bad taste in the mouth of people who are being told you're partners in a kingdom, etc., it wasn't received well. When the parliament started talking about decolonization and or other persons within the uh, society, there was almost a punitive action toward the people of St. Martin by this government. Um, in, in a matter of like, tell the parliament stop saying these type of things. I was like, I had to remind them just like, they cannot control their parliament, I cannot control mine either. And statements were made such as, yes, but you have political support in parliament. And some of the comments are coming from your support. And this is the type of thing that I had to deal with at the time. And up to the recent negotiations uh, to remove the COHO as the entity to manage the reform measures or monitor and give to the oversight, supervision. supervision to the measures, um, that was also quite an experience. But in the end, it's gone. And whatever comes has to be by mutual arrangement. But we understand mutual arrangement has different nuances when you're in a position of need. When you're in a position of need. And so every discussion that I have is nuanced with how does this line up with the apology you just made. That's what I'm telling you. So from my perspective, I continue to ensure, and others within the kingdom in my function, continue to ensure that when colonialism raises its head, that it is called out for what it is. Because the apology for me went to the slavery period, and now when I was listening to it again in English, maybe I missed it on the 19th, um, I heard and Mr. Omar mentioned and quoted parts about colonialism up until the day of today, yeah. I still believe that the Dutch government still needs more awareness of what that actually means and how the behaviors that they sometimes still exhibit are completely still reflective of said colonialism. Of course. Yeah. Again, again, I'm not going to put my personal opinion about that here. Um, I believe this is something the population needs to decide about, and then the government can take that 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 mandate, mandate and run with it. Yes, certain tomorrow can jump up and say it, but it will be something that I will have to do with uh, with my intention intentionally and not based on a question asked on the floor here today. There's a lot that needs to be done, thought out, and the awareness of our population 
has to be there for us to be and, and for them to understand because certain things were said just now and I'm, I'm they gave me the cut sign but the attachment to the Dutch passport and that 70 percent of who is here now and came for that Dutch passport plays a huge role in the realities of what we're dealing with today. So that being said, I'll take the cut sign for now and allow the other questions to be asked. But I'm happy that there is such a fever for this discussion. Yes. Um, thank you, sir. You, you addressed something very important when you were speaking about um, reparations or restorative justice while we're in a construct that we're in right now. As, <clears throat> as the Prime Minister just stated just now, uh, for the past five years we've been under duress and basically what we have in St. Martin, which Capricorn nations don't have, is what I would call a power imbalance, a huge power imbalance. And it comes from the legal construct that we're under with certain articles, etc., etc. So I don't really have a question, I kind of have a statement for the committee and everybody. Mm -hmm. While we're going through this for point two, let us try to look at what is the cause of the power imbalances that continually over and over, when we turn our, turn our necks this way or that way, there's always some kind of legal construct that is always as a form of external intervention impeding our progress as a people. If we don't address this power imbalance, we can't talk about mutual agreements because the goalposts are going to change, just like they did with COVO, they continue to change. So we must, as a people, look at the power imbalances that we have within the kingdom, get them corrected, and then we can move forward about an apology and restorative justice. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Comrade Green, thank you very much. Um, let me just ask two quick questions, and one is for um, the government, the Prime Minister. Um, is there going to be any form of discussion or any form of apology from the kingdom on the visit of the king? The king? Uh, that's the first question. Uh, is there going to be any apology when the king comes sometime next week? Any form of apology? Because they, they, they're the one responsible. They're the one responsible for the whole thing. Okay? And they come away with it. That's the answer. Okay. And second, second question. My second question, because I know we we, we trapped for time, is for my comrade Dobri. Um, can you help us? Because we see what has been going on in Barbados and other places, and I'm sure in Antigua you guys are doing the same thing. In the preparation to deal with the the, the, the British government and making the preparation process popular, the committee have, have done a certain amount of work. We started with the, with the park in Barbados, we started refurbishing of the University of the West Indies campus by Henry Beckles. We started name changes of roads and all that kind of stuff. Our capital, where we are standing, still named after us, Lake Master. Our airport still, still named after us, the royalty. That kind of confusion that is going on in my country. Can you advise us on that? Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. I really don't have much advice to give because we have been battling those same, we have been fighting those same battles in most of our territories. There has been some success in Dominica, a couple of name changes here and there. But, yeah, but our government seem reluctant to even engage in decolonization at that level that still exists in our independent um, countries. It's about advocacy and it's about just continuing fighting. It's about writing letters every year. Where the Antiguan Barbuda Reparations Commission holds its largest event in the botanical gardens in Antigua are named the Victoria Gardens. <laughs> we write, we fight, we do everything to even just get it called the botanical gardens. Nothing. All I'm suggesting, you know, those of us in this battle, we understand that we're talking life work. We understand that it's a baton we have to pass. And we just have to make sure that history records that we have played the part. It's ongoing work. Yes, thank you, <laughs> Mr. Omar. Um, 
In that regard, I want to tag on to that question first and then go back to the first. Prior to the whole discussion of slavery past, the Ministry of General Affairs, in discussion with different departments, but also including the Ministry of the Department of Culture within uh, Ministry ECYS, have been preparing for a heritage committee or council, which is already, let's call it, budgeted for within culture department. Um, so that, in fact, when this came up, I figured that this committee would have been a subcommittee of that, because mm -hmm. that heritage committee would have been focused on nation building. Um, and so that plan, and, and of course, heritage, culture, and all of it. So we still have to see, based on this push and this urgency now, where this will fit in the greater picture and the vision of the country in terms of ensuring in all areas we build that. Renaming buildings, roads, everything else is part of it. When we came yeah. in 2019, there was already a plan to rename this area, go back to what it was, Great Bay. Um, and proposals have been made, et cetera, but you have to do it in a concerted effort, and I would like to have a set of people specific mm -hmm. for that. It would include the Ministry of Rami as well, that have roads and all of that to deal with. To go yeah. back to the question on... Kings. Oh, the king has made a statement, and in fact, I and others said uh, that the king should have been the one to make it. Yeah. However, CARICOM mm -hmm. acknowledges that the highest um, official within the state should mm -hmm. make it, and they acknowledge that oh, the can prime make minister it. Yeah. Can. can. The prime minister is the highest body. Um, the king is a figurehead, and so he acknowledges, though, and has made a statement that he will be investigating, etc., etc., and he expects it to take three years, etc. So I am not going to make any demands about an apology from the king. We have gotten you have what I will be had from the Dutch government, yeah. and the next step, as Mr. Omar mentioned, it's an official apology. Mr. Omar mentioned that it is the gateway to, while we would have expected some statement on the reparations or the openness for it, we would have expected it. In fact, a research I did just last night showed that in 20, sorry, in 2002, a Dutch Prime Minister, Wilcox, also made an apology, and that in 2020, already they had announced that there would be an establishment of a reparations Netherlands fund. So I will have to do more digging, mm -hmm. more research, or have the professionals do that to determine exactly what the intention was then as this of it now, mm -hmm. that the report came out and they had to respond. Um, and as I stated in my response to the apology, no assistance and aid given now can be lined up as part no, of no, reparations. No, no, no. And that question was in my last letter to the State Secretary in terms of is a uh, debt cancellation, anything that is done in this period before we agree on what reparations should look like, going to be deducted from reparations? And that's when the statement was made. We're not making any statements about reparations. So for me, we are at the drawing board. We have to determine what reparations have to look like for us, and that is what I would like to have the committee take charge of, of ensuring we know. Yeah. So some people in this room were approached to be on the committee already. Others put their names forward. Some said I prefer to be an advisor. So all of that will be worked out on the way forward. The last question for tonight. Um. This question is to continue on the reparations. It might be a little far-fetched, but it's important. Um, is how beneficial with the, will the fiat money, which is not backed by any natural resources and constantly manipulated in forex, um, you know, do with the reparations if they control the value of it? You understand? And are we working on reparations of natural resources such as agriculture, food, gold, silver, minerals, 
you know, and other natural resources that we will have control over, you know, because the colonizers control all them things. And will it be without trade sanctions, like the current sanctions they have on Haiti, because you know they got a lot of natural resources that they don't control, and they was the first free black republic, you understand? And um, how sure, if we get those, um, you know, um, freedoms, like controlling our trades and whatnot, how sure are we that we won't get invaded again, like the Haitians, like they're getting invaded right now, yeah. to control those natural resources? So I wanted to know if we have something in plan for them. Answer is no. Okay. That's, that's the real important question. Yeah. Uh, I think the whole question of non-repetition is part of our understanding of the apology, question of non-repetition of what you have suggested as invasion, et cetera, et cetera. We consider that a commitment of the apology, right? And we can make that known. We also consider, in terms of international reparations, issues that you have mentioned like the issue of the embargoes, et cetera, that have been placed against us, that we are suggesting that through reparations, that the weight and the, the say of our territories be increased in the international organizations, in the United Nations, in the Security Council, you know, in the financial organizations of the world, where we are hardly represented and essentially have been on the receiving end of decisions that they make in their own interests. So it's all part of the broader plan. As a matter of fact, the call for um, seats on the United Nations commissions go all the way back to the 19, 1995 Abuja conference and reparations that I mentioned that took place in Africa. So it's, it's, it's under consideration, but we have to fight all the battles at different levels, um, you know, until we get, we get to that final stage for the big negotiation. Yeah. Thank you so much, yeah. Mr. Omar. Thank you so much uh, to all of the interested citizens of St. Martin who have taken the time out to be here from 4 to 6 and are here until 7. Huh? I appreciate this on a Saturday evening, afternoon, um, but I could not delay any longer. Other things kept cropping up, and I'm like, we really have to get this done and it worked out for this afternoon. It's the first step, but there are many, many more steps to be taken. The point that I want to, that I have taken away, because though we asked Mr. Omar to speak, we did not dictate what he could speak on, uh, how far it would go. But whereas we were looking at the starting point for this committee to be the 10 points, the starting point, eh? because I can already tell you at least two or three points the Dutch are saying absolutely no to. But we must know what we want to yeah. start a negotiation. And so uh, no, having three options gives the committee a broader scope to be able to narrow down what is best for St. Martin Tech. Um, of course, liaising with the other committees that may be in Curacao, Aruba, Suriname, and even in the Netherlands, those in the diaspora there who have been, and I think this is something we weren't aware of, they have been fighting this fight in the Netherlands for a much longer period, right. vocally with committees, the Ninsei and others. And so I welcome collaboration with like-minded persons, especially as descendants of the enslaved, um, in this, I don't want to say fight, but way forward, progress forward, because for us, at St. Martin, what my vision entails is that we are financially independent or have a plan for financial independence so that you can properly negotiate from a power of strength. This being in need and back against the wall thing does not feel right. It does not feel right. And when, especially when 
things are thrown in your face from the past and you're, you are still being blamed for it, but there you blame for things of the past. So we are at the point now where the dialogue has started. We are grateful for that. Karagam has helped me to see that you don't look a gay horse in the mouth or whatever you stick it <laughs> or phrase is. You may not have gotten exactly what you wanted in that apology, but it is a starting point. And we will utilize the words used in that apology. Comma, not a full stop. And some of the other yeah, points yeah, that yeah. Mr. Omar quoted from that uh, speech that will be key because as he said, it opens the door to liability. So we either will negotiate it out or go the other route. Yeah. So thank you so much. I look forward to your participation on the committee. In this as sounding board, there will be panel discussions where you may not be on the committee, but you will have a voice on that um, panel discussion that will lead to the discussion paper or the preparation for the negotiation documentation. Thank you for your participation. Thank you to my staff for preparing for this. Thank you to Mr. DeGreen for taking the opportunity. Thank you for DCAP and all of the other staff of the government of the that made this session possible. And we look forward to continued engagement with you, Mr. Martin.